What's up, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Holics podcast. My name is Jordan Jica, and I'm here with my co-host Rye Dog, and we are in the middle of our MLB mini series here. Uh, this is our eighth installment, and we are going to be talking about the Cincinnati Reds today. Um, and if you don't already, make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube. We're go- we have NFL content up. We're going to have a bunch of MLB podcasts. Uh, pretty soon we're working on some NBA and NHL content once those seasons kick off as well. Uh, so make sure you keep an eye out on that. But today we're talking Cincinnati Reds. So before we start, Rye Dog, what's going on? What's going on, J-Dog? The you ready for some Reds? Uh-huh. <laughs> the best team on paper. Let's do it. Yeah, on paper, and, you know, we mentioned that already in the Cubs episode, but uh, we'll see if the, uh, you know, we've seen it in every sport. There's been the dream team in the NFL with the Philadelphia Eagles that imploded, and this happens quite a few. I'm not calling the Cincinnati Reds the dream team, so if anybody's listening, don't say that the Reds are the dream team. But on paper, they made a ton of improvements, so we'll hop into their lineup to begin with. Uh, Leading off, they have Shogo from Japan. Uh, he's going to be in the outfield for him this year. He's going around pick 230, so I'll let you kick it off. Any thoughts on Shogo? I don't know much about the guy, to be honest. I mean, I know they, they signed him from over, from Japan. I really didn't think much about it. I, I didn't really think they were going to give up on uh, Senzel or Aquino. Yeah. So early, it seems like. I mean, when I, when I saw him, when I seen him make the move, I'm like, you already have outfielding depth. Yep. Uh, I, I just, I was surprised. Yeah, no, and I agree with you. So the fact that they did sign him, I think says that they're going to play him. And in general, they have outfield depth. So they have Shogo, they have uh, Castellanos, who they signed. Uh, they have Jesse Winker, who they have listed as a starter right now. They have Aquino, they have Senzel. So, I mean, it goes really deep, but the fact that they went out of their way to sign him, I think says that he's going to be playing a lot for him. Um, We know that it's a hitter-friendly park that they have. So something interesting, I didn't know a ton about him either. I researched him a little bit just, uh, you know, if they have the guy leading off, I mean, he has to be something. But uh, he never had an on-base percentage below 385 in Japan. So he draws a ton of walks. He gets on base. Not a ton of speed from what I've read, but he's a great base runner, so uh, very savvy there. So I think he's just going to be a guy that gets on base. And with their lineup and how it looks, I think he could score a ton of runs. Seems like maybe he's only a 10 to 15 steal guy, but um, you know if he has a little bit of pop, he scores 90 runs. He's going in one of the last rounds right now. I don't know. I'd keep an eye out on him. He's probably going to be on the waiver wire, but uh, I'm going to be, if he gets playing time each and every day, he might be an interesting name to keep an eye on. Oh, agreed. And, um, you know, we've seen it multiple times where teams will go out of their way, you know, to out of the country to sign outfielders and immediately bring them up because they have the playing time elsewhere. Yeah. Not necessarily the minors, but, you know, they're going to play, they, they got to play them, at least see what they have out of them. It won't make sense. I think if you're going to take an odd uh, outfielder out, I think you got to take Winker out. I mean, that's my two yep. cents. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, right behind him, you have Joey Votto, who is 36 now, which is unbelievable. He had probably his worst season since he's been in the majors last year. Still had crazy, a crazy high on base percentage. Um, he's only owned in about 20% of leagues, going as one of the last picks in drafts. I mean, at this point in his career, he's still going to get on base. His upside's limited, though. Uh, I mean, I really don't see any reason to take Votto this year. I don't either. Um, And I'll say it from a non-fantasy perspective. Guys like him and Miguel Cabrera, and um, they're they're good for the game because, you know, we like seeing them. Oh, and the Pujols throw his name in there. They're good for the game. And, I mean, you don't want to see our – childhood legends you know retire but for a fantasy perspective you know we're staying away from these guys i've seen this and just to put you on the spot quick do you think Votto's a hall of famer not first ballot but i do think he's a hall of famer oh gosh i don't want to have that debate then the first ballot debate i hate when people say that (laughs) he's not first ballot no Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Man, I don't know. I think he's a he's a good uh, argument one day. Maybe that'll have to be an episode one day, debatable Hall of Fame guys. Um, I think, but, you know, for, okay, first ballot, who gets in? 
Pujols or Miggy? You got to pick right now. Oh, Miggy oh. or Pujols? The Triple Crown or Pujols? I pick Pujols because of the longevity and his defense was better too. Agreed. And he didn't really fall off as quick as Miggy did. And Man. I think that just taints it. I loved Miggy. He was, I loved him more than Pujols, you know, not, you know, talent wise, but like as a personal fan favorite, I was always a Miggy fan, even during his playing days in Florida. So it just sucks what happened to him the last two years, I want to say. Yeah, no, I mean, it was over. That was one of those that was truly overnight. I mean, he hit 30 home runs and then all of a sudden he can't even hit 10 anymore. It seems like so uh, it's okay. been it's sad. <laughs> it is. And I mean, he broke that triple crown record. And I mean, that record was held by Carl Yaz for like 30 plus years. And I mean, that's yeah. just insane. But I mean, yeah, you, it's just crazy how much he fell off. Then right behind Votto, we have uh, Suarez playing third for him. He's going around pick 81 right now. So uh, top 10 first baseman. I think he's going as the seventh, I want to say third baseman right now so any thoughts on Suarez going 81 right now I take him I think that's excellent value and um we talked about Chris Bryant um going 40 picks 40 to almost 50 picks earlier yeah. and I mean with this season not kicking off immediately but having a whole month and a half delay you got to get these guys while their ADP is so low and while you're drafting right now you got to you got to take advantage of it because Suarez he hit 50 home runs last year, yeah. 49. He hit a ton of home runs. You And his average wasn't that low either. you got to take him, and especially with getting Castellanos. And you've got to take him. And I might even reach on him around. I like Suarez a lot, and he's a guy that's just exciting to watch. And he's in a perfect spot in the lineup, too. Yeah, no, and I think he's one of those guys that he came out of nowhere so quickly that people still are almost catching up to it. I mean, he's been really good for two years now, but I mean, I remember when he had that first big season, I said, I don't even know who this guy is, <laughs> you know? And I think some people still have that in the back of their mind. Um, one of the reasons he might be going that low after his huge season, number one, I think people are cautious just, oh, he's not going to repeat that, even though he's done it really for two seasons now. <laughs> um, but he does have a shoulder injury that he's nursing right now. He was going to miss. It looked like uh, the first week or two of the season if it did start on time but I mean you kind of already mentioned it for a guy like that that only helps him that the season is delayed you're gonna yeah. get the full season out of him now whenever it does start so I mean at that value I mean that's highway robbery <laughs> that's no question you know like I said you gotta almost really you almost gotta really take it around early and you're still getting away with murder. Yeah. I mean, he's fun to watch. I mean, I watched a little bit of Reds games last year on the uh, MLB network. I have the MLB TV. So I mean I watched him play and I like I like his approach to the play. He just brings so much fire and this offense only improving. He's not gonna hit forty nine home runs. I mean, forty is definitely within reach and he can just rehab that shoulder injury. It was yeah. nothing really serious. I believe it was just something he chose to do. Yeah. It had nothing to do with pain. I just think he wanted his shoulder to be stronger so he can continue playing third base defensively because a lot of players, once you get to that late 20s, early 30s, your shoulder starts to give out on you really quickly to the point where you have to choose if you want to play first or do you want to stick to third, which is what happened with guys like Zimmerman and even Miguel Cabrera, et cetera. So I think that's the reason why he did it. Yeah, no, and I, I would agree with that. Uh, right behind him batting cleanup is Mike Moustakis, who uh, picks up second base eligibility this year, which is very key. Uh, he's going right around pick 100 right now. You and I have actually uh, texted before about him, so I'll let you start off. What are your thoughts on Moose this year? I mean, I love Moose, and I, I'm going to be honest. Like when I uh, when we thought about our, um, you know, what we're doing next for the second baseman um, arguments, I love Moose a lot. I mean, how I put him in that argument. I mean, he's a 28, 32 home run hitter. I mean, in this lineup, he should be able to have 80 to 90 RBIs. His average is going to be a little low. I wouldn't be shocked if he hits up to 265, 270, a career high average with this lineup and this protection. They're going to start looking at guys, and as we and as you go down the order, like, well, you know, we got to walk someone, or we got to pitch to someone. 
You know what I mean? So, I mean, they're going to start walking guys like Votto and then, you know, Suarez, and they're going to end up having to pitch to someone. So, with that said, I mean, second base is shallow. Yep. I love me some Moustakis, and he's always consistent. Yeah, and I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that he leads all second basemen in home runs. And that's one no. of the reasons that I like him. You know, he's going, you know, a lot of those top second basemen, Hiora, uh, Albies, they're going around pick 40, 50. So you're getting a guy 50 to 60 picks later that might have more offensive output. He doesn't offer any uh, really value in the speed department. He's not really going to no. steal any bases. But, I mean, I don't think it's far-fetched to say, especially in that ballpark, that he leads all second basemen in home runs. And at that value, I'll take that. And uh, I have him as my second baseman in a few leagues right now. And, you know, I'm pretty confident in that. I agree. And um, to go off on the subject of hair, I mean, he's a, he's, he's still in the NL Central now. He was with the Brewers, I believe. And now he's with the Reds. So he knows he's, he's familiar with this division to the point where his numbers shouldn't decrease at all. But if anything, you know, when he faces the Brewers, he has some inside information already where he could capitalize on it. And I mean, you know, what we were talking about, like you said earlier, guys like Albies and Haru, I mean, Albies has been, this is his third season, I believe, and this will be Haru's first full season in general. So those guys don't really have much of a, of a full on track record. Of course, you'll take them because of ceiling wise, but. Ustakis' value and his floor is pretty high already. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be shocked if, like, numbers-wise, his numbers is up there with all of these. Yeah. Maybe not in the average department or stolen bases, but everything else. Yeah. Yeah, no, and in that division, he hit he had 37 home runs last year, so he actually hit a ton. So, uh, I mean, he's already proved that he can do it. Overall, I think the division is very weak in the pitching department, so that only helps him even more. Oh, I'll agree. Uh, batting behind him fifth is Nick Castellanos uh, in the outfield forum. He's going about 10 picks before Moustakis, uh, pick 92.3. I have him as my third or fourth outfielder in a few leagues. Uh, any thoughts on Castellanos this year? I like him. Um, he's another guy that he got traded to the Cubbies, I believe, mm -hmm. in the second half of the season. So he's already faced majority, if not all, of the uh, NL Central. So he's another guy. Who knows all of his um? Who knows all of his opponents already? He knows his rivalries and he knows these pitchers. So, I mean, at this rate, I'm sounding like I want to draft the entire Reds roster. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> at this a lot rate, of them I think are really good value too, because I don't think people yeah. think of the Reds as a team that's any good. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> and I'm sure that factors into it a little bit, but. I mean, that's a very hitter friendly ballpark, which helps obviously. But yeah. uh, I mean. At that value, I mean, they're all good value. Nobody in their lineup, Suarez is going the earliest at pick 81. So when you're talking at guys in the 90, 100, 120 plus range, I mean, this, yeah. that's fantastic value. Oh, yeah, agreed. And we're talking about, you know, other guys in the 100s. Like, you know, in our previous episode, we talked about the Cubs, right? Where you're talking about Craig Kimbrell, who's a closer, pick yep. 120. No way. Give me my second baseman in Moustakis. Or give me my fourth outfielder in Castell and Anos. Give me these guys over, you know, some closer that's only really good for one category. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I agree. Um, Castell Anos, too, in the second half, he batted over 300, which I'll be interested to see if he could keep up that kind of production. Once he yeah. was traded to the Cubs, that is. He was batted 300. He had 50 RBIs in the second half. So if he can keep that momentum, that'll be huge. Oh, he will, and. Before the before when the Tigers you know started to really really go on a downfall, he was actually decent when the Tigers yeah. actually had some help around him. But once they started falling like flies, Castellanos knew he had to get out of there, and I'm just glad he's back on a team that is kind of well rounded enough where he can thrive. Yep. Then second half of their lineup it starts to get a little weaker here. Number six. They have Jesse Winker listed right now, so I guess this is a good time to talk about their outfield situation a little bit. Um, Aquino is currently going at pick two. Winker's not really being drafted. Um, yeah. Aquino is going around pick 200, and then Nick Senzel, 230. And I really think a lot of those guys, especially Aquino and Senzel, have a ton of potential yeah. and talent, but really just the playing time questions are really – making their value go down a, a ton. So I'm really interested to see how the outfield playing situation turns out. Oh, I agree. And, 
you know, we're going to talk about, you know, we talked about Shogo early on and cast. I mean, Winker's the one guy. I said it earlier, and I'll say it again. Winker's the one guy, like, hey, your job's going to be on the line because we have the depth behind you. Yeah. You know, they're going to look to Aquino, and they're going to look to Stenzel. I mean, same thing with Shogo. Like, hey, man, this isn't this isn't the Japan League. This is the big leagues. You know, and if he doesn't, if he doesn't really, you know, perform like they expected, that's why they have the depth, I believe, because I believe the Reds coaching staff doesn't think either Shogo or Winker won't live up to expectations. And my money's on Winker because last mm-hmm. year he just didn't really look too well. He he just didn't look like a starter, and I'm shocked he's a starter now listed. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, and I, I think if I was going to guess how this shakes out, I think Aquino takes Winker's spot, and I think you see Senzel in kind of that ultimate utility role because he has multiple position eligibility as well. So almost in like, uh, you know, people always say the Ben Zobris kind of role is the first person <laughs> I always think of. You know, he plays um, second when Moustakis needs a break. Maybe he plays a little bit of third. He gives all three outfield spots. So he'll get his at-bats, but I think that's ultimately – where he's going to settle in is kind of that ultimate utility role. I think they should groom him into the everyday shortstop Senzel, that is, because he is quick. I like watching yeah. Senzel. And I want to talk about Senzel for a minute. I don't like how he's getting treated with Cincinnati because he was a top three overall pick. Yeah. Three years ago, 2017th draft, I believe. I believe that was right, the 2017th MLB draft. And I just, they're giving, they're giving up on him too quick. And, they're not really giving him as much time to prove his worth as opposed to the other you know, top five picks in previous drafts. Yeah, no, and that's true because right now their shortstop is Freddie Galvis, who, I mean, he's a solid shortstop. He puts up solid numbers, but I think it's solid is kind of the the word that I use. You know, nothing special, not great, not yeah. terrible. He's just okay, um, and I think that'd be a good spot for Senzel. I don't know if he has a, a ton of shortstop experience or not, but... Um, if he's right. able to make that transition, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then their catching situation, just to touch on it quickly, Tucker Barnhart's listed as their uh, starting catcher right now. No fantasy relevance. He doesn't have a ton of <laughs> offensive upside, but I wanted to make sure I mentioned him. You know, I catchers are people too. I love catchers. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, we're actually, you know, we're NL East fans, and uh, we believe, we've watched Freddie Galvis play with his time <laughs> in Philly. So we've seen what Freddie Galvis is. He's more of a defensive shortstop with little to no pop at all in his bat. So, I mean, maybe that is their plan to groom Senzel into a shortstop, which wouldn't surprise me, but we'll just have to see what happens. I just yeah. don't see them sticking with Galvis for however many games the season decides. Yeah, to no, out. and, you know, potentially maybe if Senzel plays that super utility role in the beginning of the season gives him a little bit of an opportunity to work on his craft at short until uh you know that's a long-term plan i think that would make a lot of sense for him or even have moustakis play short because moustakis can play second and third i right. assume he can play short my only thing is maybe he's not quick enough to play short but Just put him everywhere Hell yeah. Hey, 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 can play everywhere. We love we love us some moose. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be yeah, and they're another one. Their farm system's a little weak. One of the guys that I actually watched quite I watch a lot of minor league baseball. One of the guys that they have that's going to be in Double A this year is Jose Garcia, who's probably a year or two away. But uh, I think he's going to be their future shortstop. So once again, Senzel, even though he was a top pick, it seems like long term he doesn't have a defined role, which is kind of interesting because he hasn't gotten the best opportunity to show what he can do. Oh, no, not at all. And we've talked about, you know, my boy Dansby Swanson, who, I mean, he's getting there every opportunity in the yeah. world. And he was in the, t- he was drafted five years ago. So, I mean, he looked great last year, but it's just an example. I mean, even Jason Hayward, who I believe he was a, a top overall pick mm-hmm. at one point, I believe. So, I mean, and he's still somehow finding an everyday job. So, yeah, I just don't J- think Jason thumb. Hayward's 34 now, which I, I don't know. For me, that's crazy to think. Oh, <laughs> I didn't. He's thirty four. Yeah. <laughs> I want to guess late twenties. Wow, man, where is the time gone? Cause I yeah. remember first got. He didn't get called up more than like six, seven years ago, right? Man, let's see the first year that he played. Yeah, I don't. Man, when I because I was looking it up earlier, but okay, he's only thirty. I must have been thinking of okay. somebody else. So that makes more sense. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. I mean, but still, that's, that's just still older idea. than I thought he was. I still think of him as like I don't know, a twenty six year old. Oh, a 26-year-old is some pop. 
But I mean, that's these. Are, those are just guys that are getting time and time again because they've, you know, they're they invested a lot of time. For the Reds, it just seems like okay, we're going to spend our third overall pick on you. Yeah, yeah, you you showed us what you could do in one year. Now you're just going to take a back seat. So I mean, I don't really think that's a fair advantage for um, Senzel at all. Yeah, I agree. Um, let's hop over to their rotation. Uh, oh, yes. Their number one, their ace right now is Luis Castillo. He's going mm-hmm. at pick 51. Uh, he's one of those guys that I've kind of seen opinions all over the board on him. A lot of people yeah. say that's way too high. A lot of people see his potential. Um, where where do you stand on that? Well, in a previous episode, we talked about Darvish. So we're, Darvish was going and pick 60-something, right? 64? 60, yep. 60. I mean, I'm going to spend the extra couple picks on or earlier on uh, Castell- I mean, eh, Castillo just because I, I, I like I like his potential more than I do Darvish. And, I, I mean, his offense in general. So if you're in a wins league, you know, Castillo will give you the opportunity to uh, get a win or even a uh, quality start if you do quality start cats. But the only thing that really – that really bugs me is uh, we've mentioned it before. Cincinnati Reds play in the hitters park, so mm-hmm. it's going to be tough. I mean, it's nothing crazy small like Camden Yards, but pitchers have succeeded in the past, so I don't really put too much thought into it, but it's definitely a stop sign there. Yeah, no, and I think where he's being drafted kind of shows that. Um, you know, I don't know. I'm kind of on the fence about him. He's not a guy that I'm crazy about. I think that's a fair – a fair value for him. Um, I don't know how confident I'd be with him being my second starter though. You know, he, I think the biggest thing that I like though, he showed a ton of improvement last year. And when you dive into his improvement, nothing was really fluky. You know, all of his numbers were good. Uh, his K rate was fine. Uh, swing and miss percentages, all of that was fall fine and dandy. So I just think it's a matter of he puts together another strong season no, he can be a top 10 pitcher, and he has that potential. So if you're taking him at that number, he's probably going about uh, the 15th pitcher overall. And if you're taking him with, as the 15th pitcher overall, I think that's really fair. You know, I agree. When you compare his upside versus the risk of him. Or pitchers around, like the Giolitos or the uh, yeah. Darvishes, you know. I want to take Castillo over them. And then behind him right now, they have Sonny Gray. He is going to pick 110 approximately right now, so middle-of-the-round guy. Um, I've always loved Sonny Gray when he was in with the athletics when he first came up. I thought he was <laughs> going to be an absolute you know, Cy Young contender each and every year. Um, and from what, I've saw, what I saw last year, I think he showed uh, that ability that he showed uh, early in his career. Uh, he has two-plus pitches. Obviously, the team's good. He's going to have a chance – to accumulate wins and if he stays healthy his k rate's good i don't see any reason that he can't return to that form that he had early in his career but the big if is if he stays healthy and i think that's why he goes in the middle rounds if he was a guy that was healthy each and every year we'd probably be talking about him as a top 15 pitcher but i think it's great value for a guy that if he does stay healthy he has that huge upside potential yeah no that's the reason why he's going so high, like you said. It's because of his injury history. I mean, I would take him at that rate because guys in the 100s, they're not your studs. They're, you know, they're guys that you can, like, throw a dart on for the ceiling part. So, I mean, I would take Ray. He's shown flashes in the past, especially last year. He had an under-3 ERA with the Yankees last year. So, I like I like Ray a lot. Um, I think he's a 15-win guy, 200 Ks. Yep. 3.3.0 ERA. So I mean, I'll take that value any day, and I'll take that as my third or fourth pitcher, wherever that may be. Yeah, no, and I agree with that. And right behind him, their top three are all kind of interesting. Uh, number three, they have Trevor Bauer right now. He's going at pick ninety. I thought it was a little interesting. He's going about twenty picks higher than Sonny Gray, because you want to talk about Sonny Gray's injury history. Trevor Bauer has an extremely long history of injuries. So I was surprised to see him going 90. You know, I think he has a ton of upside, but yeah. um, he's also going to be a free agent this off season. You know, we always talk about it more in football about that motivating players, but um, yeah. I, uh, I don't know. I just, his injury history is too long for me to take him at that spot. I understand he has a very high K rate and people kind of their eyes get all buggy when they see that. So 
Oh, I yes. think maybe that's where he's going and why he's going that high. But I don't know. I'm not overly comfortable taking him in that spot. I'm not either. Um, he did have 250 Ks. I mean, it, it's like a, you know, it's an eye catcher. But, you know, for drafting with me, you know, I'm not afraid to take the guy that doesn't get the strikeouts early on. Mm-hmm. Guy like Bauer, I mean, if I can get 250 Ks and pick around 90, I mean, I'll take a look at it. And if, if he falls it's my next pick, I'll keep him on my queue. And, you know, and if he doesn't make it past the round later, because I always we always like to get value out of guys. Yep. So if I'm like, oh, yes, I got him around later. But I wouldn't take him right where his ADP is. Yeah, and I think it kind of depends who's left on the board. Um, I also yeah. don't want that. I wouldn't let that injury history scare me to where I let him slip too far. I, and I, I think that's the key to it is you keep an eye out on him. And I don't know, I you know, it's once again, it depends on, I think baseball more than any other, in my opinion, is my strategy changes throughout the draft, depending on how the board is playing out. So if I have yeah. a ton of power in the beginning, you know, that influences how I'm going to draft later and vice versa. If I want to take a guy like Bauer with a ton of risk, you know, very high K rate, I'm going to need to somehow make up for that either earlier or later in the draft with, you know, maybe Soroka, you know, I say, okay, he doesn't get a ton of Ks but I'm going to pair him up with Bauer who has a ton of Ks and maybe his ERA and whip isn't as high. But uh, I I think that's one of those things is you really have to make sure when you're drafting that it's, you don't go in there with one strategy. You really have to play the board, consider what your roster looks like and try to create a a well-rounded roster more than anything else. I agree. And that's what I typically like to do. You know, if I, if I get a guy like a Granky or a Soroka, you know, who, who are, generally going to go in the top 60 70 picks you got to have the mindset like okay this guy just drafted he helped my era he helps my whip he helps my quality starts and wins but now i need to get some strikeouts let me find a guy with a 3.4 era or lower at but with like 240 250 strikeouts yeah, for sure. Uh, back half of their rotation, I think they're more streamer options. They're not really being drafted right now. Uh, Anthony D. Scalafini and then Wade Miley. Um, then <laughs> big names there. Uh, <laughs> Wade Miley, uh, former <laughs> Oriole. <laughs> yeah, he's been around a little bit now, too. He's been with several teams. Yeah. I remember him with the Diamondbacks. <laughs> he, was, he actually wasn't too terrible with the O's. I mean, terrible enough where he wasn't relevant for fantasy, of course. Right. But you look at that and you're like, oh, dear God, Wade Miley's still with the team. What now? <laughs> he's Yeah, I mean, I think he's the definition of like that fifth, sixth kind of depth yeah. guy. I mean, but... he's good. I like him. I mean, I'm not going to – Anthony, Anthony DeFelisani and, and Miley. I mean, if if they're facing the Pirates in PNC Park, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a Sunday day streamer or whatever, but – Outside of that, yeah, I'm pass on. Yep, and then uh, their closer is Iglesias this year. He's going around hunt, pick 128. So same as Kimbrel. Once again, you know, make yeah. sure you look at your league scoring. He has a ton of Ks. He's proven that he's a capable closer. Um, the Reds should be pretty good this year, or at least better, so that he'll have more opportunities. So once again, uh, if it's a saves league, that's probably about where he's going to go. That's fair. But if it's a holds league, you can wait a little bit. Who's their setup guy there? Their setup guy right now. Let's see who they have listed. I can't think of the top of my head. Yeah, I don't think it's really anybody. Uh, right now they uh, have it listed as Amir Garrett, um, who got suspended oh, okay. last year. He showed a yeah. little bit of potential, but um, not really a guy that's probably going to take many opportunities from him. No, not really. No one notable. I thought, I mean, I'm not really sold on the Glacier, so I was wondering, you know, I don't know if it, maybe they have someone in their setup guy, but. You know, Iglesias is not bad, so it's, like you said, league settings, check it out, etc. Yeah. Then wrapping it up here, um, they're another one of those teams. They're very top-heavy right now as far as how their organizational talent is spread out. The major league roster is pretty good. Uh, their farm system's currently ranked 24th, so one spot behind the Cubs, actually. And it's another oh. system. They have a ton of young guys. Not many of them are in double A or past double A right now. The only one that might make their appearance this year is their third ranked prospect is a guy named Tyler Stevenson. He's a catcher. Um, Their catching position isn't really 
completely solid. So you might see him in the majors this year, but really no one else of note. Um, so any notes that you want to make on the Reds before we finish? We talked about it in the Cubs episode. I think yeah. we both think that they have a good opportunity to win the division, you know, at least on paper. Um, yeah. And I think they'll be at least fun to watch. Oh, I agree. I mean, both the teams so far we talked – I mean, even all three so far, the Brewers, the Cubbies, and uh, now we're currently on the Reds. You know, all three of these teams, they really don't have much prospects in their farm system. So yeah. – you think they're all ready to, to win now, built to win now? I mean, no, no way the Brewers are built to win now. I mean, they, they're they either in re, they're trying to be in rebuild mode, but they're not really – they don't really have anything for rebuild mode in a way other than Harua. I mean, he's going to be nice. But I think the Reds are a solid 85, maybe 90-win team. I mean, if we're looking on paper, granted they're not going to get 90 wins with a shortened season. But yeah, if we had a full season, I think 85 to 90 is definitely within reach. It, with yeah. their three pitchers, they're just well-rounded, and there's nothing to really hate on this team. If they can perform the way they look on paper, they should be in the NLCS next year. Yeah, no, and I agree that they're, uh, a lot of the projection models have them about 84, 85 wins, and I think that's fair for them. So uh, they'll be fun to uh, watch this year, and, uh, I don't think I have any other notes on them. Anything else that you want to talk about with the Reds? Um, that's it. Um, just let our viewers know. Don't let Suarez or Mustakis fall too deep. Yeah, no, and I think that's kind of key with them. So I think that's, that's all that we have today then. So thanks, everybody, once again for tuning in to another episode of the Fantasy Holics Podcast. This is our Major League Baseball edition. So if you don't already, make sure you like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at FantasyHolics1, and make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube. So thanks for tuning in, and we will see you next time.